So thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, I had spoken with one of our uh, attendees. We're, getting, uh, we're trying to get this queued up on Facebook Live too, so uh, the rest of Sabre Chicago can join us here. depending on how you uh, wish to call him, but uh, we're just thrilled that you could all be here today. Um, our group is dedicated to finding ball players from the 1800s or uh, baseball pioneers who are in unmarked graves or badly worn graves, and that we lend the resources to try and fix the oversight as best we can. Um, for people who kind of wonder, you know, why we worry about cemeteries, I know there's a lot of people who probably think, understandably, the cemeteries are creepy and not a place that you want to go to. Um, for me, the answer is real simple. I, I look at this more as giant open air museums. Um, at Rose Hill, especially, uh, you've got titans of Chicago industry here. You've got mayors, you've got aldermen, you've got war heroes. Uh, this being Chicago, you've got gangsters. Everybody uh, of all walks of life are buried here. Vice President. Vice President. So that's all part of the fabric of Chicago. And in, in baseball terms, um, you know, Jack Brickhouse is interred here. Uh, Many people who were involved in the White Sox in the Black Sox scandal are here, as well as several other ball players. Uh, one of whom is one of a handful of ball players who gave his life in World War One is buried here. So there's a lot of baseball history here, and uh, Ed Williamson is, is a huge part of that, and we're glad that uh, now he will not be forgotten or, uh, or unmarked any longer. Um, I first learned about Ed Williamson a few years ago when I was trying to learn a little bit more about 19th century baseball, and the thing that stood out, he's uh, set the 19th century record when he hit 27 home runs in 1884. And that's almost double the existing record for a single season home runs. So that stands out pretty highly. Uh, there's some interesting reasons as to why that happened, and we may get into that a little bit. But um, as I learned more about Ed, I learned about his early death, uh, his burial here at Rose Hill, and the fact that he has been in an unmarked grave uh, ever since, so for more than 120 years. And I thought that was a terrible oversight, and I love to find a way to fix it.
by David Stalker, and he's uh, helped us with all the Great Barker projects and has commi uh, commissioned monuments uh, all across the country related to baseball. So we're grateful for his excellent work. And uh, lastly, uh, this project wouldn't be uh, possible if the cemetery had just said no, or we don't want to do the research, or we don't know how to do the research. Uh, but Rose Hill jumped right in on this. They understood the historical significance of it and have been wonderful partners for this uh, all through the process. Uh, my contact, Deidre, was able to uh, go into Rose Hill's vaults and look at the original internment records to help locate where Ed Williamson was originally buried, where he was disinterred to, and where he is now. And uh, this whole thing wouldn't be possible without her help. And uh, I was hoping she'd be here, um, but I just... Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to her help, and, and Rose Hill has been just a fantastic partner to work with. Uh, so, uh, again, the, beyond that, I want to thank all of you for coming out and helping us. Uh, members of the Chicago Cubs have come out to help us uh, welcome Ed, uh, Ed Stone, and we're grateful for you all being here as well, too. Uh, so we're going to have uh, our main speaker come on in a bit, but uh, I do want to introduce uh, Dave Stevens. Who uh, had written uh, an article about Ed Williamson in a Sabre Research Journal uh, a few years ago? Uh, he wrote an article called Home Run King Without a Headstone. So uh, I'm thrilled you're here. I'm sorry that we kind of ruined your headline because it's a great one. But he has a nice one. But, but uh, do you want to say a little bit too? So we'll let, uh, we'll let him say a few words. Well, I, I wrote that article back in Sabres publication, The National Pastime, and um, uh, I had an article in there, and here it is, A Home Run King Without a Headstone, and I was sure hoping that he'd get a headstone before now. He wrote in an article. Uh, 
the first warm days of spring revive the old love. We can scarcely wait until the snow has left the field. An old ball carefully laid away by spring practice is brought out of the truck, and a sensation of warmth steals over him as he grasps it in his hand. The old bat is fondled, and though it feels remarkably light, he dreams of the destruction soon be dealing out. How absurd of these magnates to pay us for that which we prefer to anything else. And John Mark Reward at the time was making $4,000 a year. And Pinchin was making about $3,500 a year. But two months later, the owner slashed the salaries to a cap of $2,500. Salary cut. Anyway, what's the gold one? Yeah, twenty five hundred dollars. That, that was roughly that was roughly about fifty thousand dollars. Anyway, so uh, to tell us a little bit more then about the man of the hour, we'll uh, have uh, Richard Smiley come out. hope everybody can hear me. I'll try to project here. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about who he is. And we're still, you know, uh, Sam is still doing research on him. So we'll hopefully find out more. Uh, what I can say is that, as you will see on the marker, Ed, Edward Nagel Williamson was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, on October 24, 1857. And we don't know a lot about his life before baseball. It's just we've been looking and there hasn't he just kind of all of a sudden appears on the scene as an amateur youth baseball player in 1875 when he was 17 years old. He played on a Philadelphia team called the Shy. which was in Braddock, Pennsylvania, and that's where he finished out the season. And even in that one year, his reputation was good enough that in 1876, he joined a club called, a semi-pro club called the Neshahanna Club in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And mind you, he's 18 years old at this time, and he was named captain. That's how impressive he was. He became a captain of the team at the year 18, you know, when he was 18 years old. And also on the team was this year's Sabre 2021 19th century baseball legend, Charlie Bennett, who was a catcher. And at the time, Ed was also a catcher. And so, because Ed was versatile, to accommodate Bennett, he moved to third base. So then he became a third baseman. And after Neshahanek disbanded towards the end of the season, partially with hints of a little bit of a gambling scandal that Ed himself wasn't involved with, but some of the, you, you could, through all the notes, you could infer who the players were who might have been tossing some games. So the team disbanded, and so he ended up going to the Etna Club of Detroit and finished up there. Um, in 1877, he signed on as captain, this time of the semi-pro Allegheny, Pennsylvania Club, where he played second base, third base, and catcher. And these are like, and, and Allegheny was a step above uh, the Shahanic. So he was, he was like climbing the ranks, even though he wasn't a full player lead. He was like, he was getting more notoriety. You started to see his name appear in uh, the box score. And so uh, the next year, 1878, because of this reputation that he had built, he was able to join the Indianapolis Club, which was in baseball, you know, uh, I want to say the International Association of America, it was like, it was officially baseball's minor league, so he had moved from semi-pro to actually a fully professional team, yeah, you know, it was minor leagues, and it was the Indianapolis Club, and among the games, Indiana, among the teams Indianapolis played that year were the White Stockings, so 
so the White Stockings did get to see him play in person and saw what he could do. So the next year, the White Stockings grabbed him, in addition to a couple of other players. And, you know, and then he remained in Chicago in one form or another for the rest of his career. He played on the White Stockings for, you know, from 1879 to 1889. And then in 1890, as was mentioned, he was on the Players League team in Chicago. Then he retired. Um, he was he came in. He was the White Stockings third baseman through 1885. And then after 1885, they flipped him with uh, the shortstop, and he became the team's shortstop for the rest of the time he was there. Once again, he was very versatile. As a member of the White Stockings, Ed was part of one of the original baseball dynasties. The White Stockings won the National League Championship in 1880, 1881, 1882, 1885, and 1886. And you know, during that time, his reputation was starting to grow. He was always known as a good fielder, and then the hitting kind of followed. And you know, what, what he was really known on the, the field, you know, he was very bulky. He was like five foot 11, 170, 180, maybe bigger, which at that time was pretty big. Uh, but yet he was considered quick on his feet and he covered a lot of ground in the field. So a lot of people thought he was one of the best fielders in the game, could do a lot of things. And especially what he was known for was his ability to make strong throws. He had a great arm. He, you know, there was a, a throwing contest in Cincinnati in 1888 and he threw a ball that came within half a foot of actually breaking the throwing record that was that had been set like six or seven years early. I mean, he was like, he had a tremendous arm, he was sure-handed, and he led the league in fielding on four separate occasions. Uh, now, as a hitter, he was patient and powerful. You know, he would draw some walks, and initially, you know, his average wasn't that good, but that got better over time. And as other people have mentioned, uh, what happened is the White Stocking Park, uh, where Millennium Park is now, White Stocking Park was existing, and in 1883 they did a remodel. It was the same park, but they remodeled it, and they reoriented, reoriented home plate. And as a result, right field was very shallow. Like, you know, there's been different estimates. Some estimates even say that the right field wall was less than 200 feet away from you know, home plate. And Ed could take advantage of it. And the first year there, you know, in 1883, there was a 40-foot screen above the, the the wall or the fence. And so there was like a six or seven foot fence and then a 40-foot screen above it. If you hit it over the fence and into the screen, 1883, the ground rules called that a double. So that year, Ed led the league in doubles with 49. The following year, they had the same orientation configuration, except now anything that cleared the wall, whether it hit the screen or not, was a home run. And that's when Ed set the home run record. So he was able to take advantage of that. But in general, even after that, he was improving as a hitter. Overall, he was like, um, he was a solid, you know, the way to put it is, when you look at his record, he was a solid contributor to the offense. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't Adrian Anson, he wasn't George Gore, he wasn't some of the other hitters they had, but you know, he, he, he carried his weight and he was a great fielder. And on the bases, he was also known for his sliding technique. He employed something called the Kelly spread, which is a variation of the modern day hook slide. And so he was known as a good base runner and a very good uh, you know, slider. So. Uh, summary, the type of player he was, he was versatile. He could play all the positions in the field to a high quality, maybe except for pitcher. And in fact, even in 1881, he pitched a few games for the White Stockings, but really that wasn't his forte. But on the field, he could play any of those positions well. And so he was versatile in the sense of a Gilman Duval or a Ben Zobers or something like that who could just put wherever you wanted, and then he uh, also was what would be considered the things, you know, he was, he had power, he had, you know, he could hit, he was a great fielder, he had a great arm, a great base runner, 
So it would be that version of like a five-tool player. He was a great overall player. And in fact, numerous contemporaries said, you know, Ed was the greatest all-around player we ever saw. Now, they're not saying he was the best player, but what they were saying is this is a guy who could just fill in and everything and be good at it. And, you know, whatever you wanted him to do, whether it be field the ball, slide, play third, play second, play back, he was just providing excellent everywhere. So he's like the most versatile player. So, um, Ed was a member of Albert Spaulding's 1889 World Tour. And on the field in Paris, he ripped up his knee. And he that, and that knee injury never really healed properly. So he started becoming ineffective as a you know, uh, player. And so his final year with the Players League team in 1890 wasn't good. He, just, he was no longer a good player. So he retired after that. And he opened the bar uh, roughly. You know, uh, and, uh, he, he opened the bar with former White Stocking Jimmy Wood who some people may realize, arguably, is the original Cub. But, you know, Jimmy Wood, he was like the first professional ball player under contract to a Chicago team. And, uh, well, openly, let's put it this way, he was the first openly professional player under contract to a Chicago team. There were a few years earlier, there were other players getting paid. And, just wasn't really uh, and so he, he, he had this bar with located on Dearborn, just south of Madison, and, uh, and it's, it was in an area of the city that, like, ten years earlier had been known as, like, the gambling hub of the city. It's kind of where, you know, like, um, a few blocks west of there until the fires in 1871 and 1874 hit. The, the red light district was on Well Street, a few blocks west of there, and Dearborn, that area was kind of the gambling district, and then, as that was pushing on, you know, there were still obviously still remnants of that crowd there. So that's where they put their bar. It was very successful, and um, and it was kind of the court area. A lot of the, the court buildings, the city hall, had been built around there. So you kind of had these young, you know, young professional, middle professionals who, like, if they wanted to get a drink and wager, they knew they could go to that bar and do it. So it it did very well. Now, part of the problem is Ed, Ed always had trouble with his weight, he had trouble staying in shape, and once he was out of baseball, he just let go. Uh, I haven't found it, but you know, somebody told me there were reports that he, have may, he may have been up to as much as 300 pounds by you know, the like time he was on the verge of dying. He developed uh, uh, dropsy, and so he died from that. He went to Arkansas to a natural springs to get treatment, and there he died on March 3, 1894. And so the final thing I'll mention is that, so his body was returned to Chicago. Visitors were received in his home on Congress Street, just west of California. I've looked it up on Google Maps, and that's still a residential block. That was something that didn't get wiped out by the cemetery, although looking at the building, I don't think these were the 1890 buildings. I think the building he was in was long gone, but that's still a residential area. And then services were held in Calvary Episcopal Church, which was near Western and Madden Road, also long gone. And the attendees included Billy Sunday, Fred Pfeffer, Charles Comiskey, Jimmy Wood, Mrs. Adrian Anson, Anson and Albert Goodwell Spaulding. And the band escorted the procession to Rose Hill, where he was buried with a bunch of violets pinned to his lapel. So he was buried here, and he almost certainly would have had a headstone. So I'm thinking it just it just eroded or something. So it wasn't like so I mean some of the myths that like he was a pauper when he died, no. He was you know his bar was doing well. They had the money, they buried him here, and for whatever reason, the headstone didn't last. So we are here replacing that. And uh and when I'm through talking, and I think I'm finished talking, but later on I can tell people a story about the violence. So that's what I've got.
field both in the field and at bat. Then send the 19th century single season home run record with the Chicago White Stockings in 1884 with 27. So, after uh, after 100 some odd years of being unknown, here we are. So again, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, this was a really great opportunity. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. So I'll uh, step out of the way. Y'all can take all the photos and whatever you want.